Good evening. I'm Carolyn Schoenberger and I want to welcome you to Immigration Forum. I am very excited tonight because we have a very special guest. We have a tax accountant with whom I teach at Harold Washington College and he does a lot of tax work and has some very important information about taxes and people who are immigrants. So we're going to have a great discussion. We're going to talk about ITIN numbers. We're going to talk about dependents. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but first, I'm going to talk first in the English language and then in the Spanish language about the Chicago Legal Clinic. The Chicago Legal Clinic was established in 1981 by two recent law school graduates who had just passed the bar. Bishop Thomas John Paprocki and Edward Grossman wanted to establish a clinic in South Chicago. South Chicago at one point had a lot of steel mills and there were a lot of businesses, but as the steel mills closed and people lost their jobs, there was, people did not have money to go to a movie or out to a restaurant, and businesses went out of business. And there was no local, low-cost legal clinic that could help people who were losing their businesses, losing their homes. So the Chicago Legal Clinic was established in 1981 in a one-story lot across from what is now Olive Harvey College. And today, in 2017, there, South Chicago still has a rather large building that is the Chicago Legal Clinic. There's also a branch of the Legal Clinic in Pilsen um, across from St. Pius V Church. That is where I have my office. There's also an a office in Austin, downtown. There are several free illegal advice clinics in the Daily Center dealing with child support as well as chancery and name changes. Plus, I run a legal clinic for the students giving free legal advice and referrals at, at Harold Washington College. So if you have a question dealing with immigration, if you have a question dealing with real estate, if you have a problem dealing with social security disability, a problem dealing with bankruptcy, if you need advice, if you're a victim of domestic violence, please contact our office from Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, by calling 773-731-1762, 773-731-1762. If you have a question while we're talking, please call the number on the screen. The number is 312-736-1060. 1060. So again, we invite you to call us with your questions and we have lots of interesting information to give you. So now I'm going to talk to you in Espanol. Buenas tardes, me llamo Carolina Schoenberger y yo quiero decirle un poco de la Clínica Legal de Chicago. La Clínica Legal de Chicago fue establecido en 1981 por dos nuevos abogados que querían ayudar a la gente del sur de Chicago. Antes de 1980, había muchas acerías en el sur de Chicago, pero se cerraron las acerías y la gente que trabajaba en las acerías perdieron su trabajo. También los negocios del sur de Chicago sufrieron por la falta de clientes. En este barrio no había ninguna oficina uh, legal ofre ofreciendo ayuda legal a bajos costos, entonces, los dos abogados establecieron la clínica legal de Chicago en un solo cuarto. Hoy, más que 30 años, hay cuatro oficinas en los barrios de Chicago, al sur de Chicago, Pilsen, por donde yo trabajo, y también Austin en el centro. También hay varias oficinas en las cortes que ofrecen ayuda legal gratuita gratuita a la gente con problemas de mantenimiento de los niños, si tiene problemas con foreclosure. Uh, también hay una oficina en Harold Washington College por los, los estudiantes. Es, yo trabajo como profesora uh, en Harold Washington College. Um, si usted necesita ayuda legal con asuntos de divorcios, inmigración, bienes raíces, testamentos, ha de llamar al número um, 773-731-1762, 773-731-1762, lunes al viernes 
a las 9 de la mañana a las 5 de la tarde, entonces llámanos. Si tiene una pregunta, llama el número allá, 312-736-7777. Diez, sesenta. So, puede llamarnos ahora para hacer una pregunta. Yo sé por mucha gente hay, hay un tiempo de ansiedad. Por favor, consigue ayuda. Hay mucha ayuda. Hay unos talleres por donde puede conocer sus derechos. Siempre es muy importante conocer y uh, podemos hablar un poco más cuando sabemos un poco más de lo que va a pasar. So before we begin, again, I know there's a lot of fear out there. I, I have to confess that uh, there's a lot of anxiety that many people who offer assistance to immigrants are feeling too. And the important thing is find out what your rights are. You do have rights. There are workshops around the city. Find out what your rights are. And uh, we, when we know more, we will tell people. So with that, again, I'd like to welcome Luis. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So Luis uh, is a tax attorney and, and offers classes at Harold Washington College. I have to say, how is a tax attorney different than, uh, not tax attorney, tax accountant different than another accountant? Uh, well, for starters, uh, usually most uh, tax accountants are licensed certified public accountant or licensed enrolled agent. I'm a licensed certified public accountant. I specialize in tax services for individuals, uh, businesses, and not-for-profit organizations. Uh, my services, my tax services consist of anything from tax preparation, tax planning, and also representing individuals in front of the IRS. So I would say a tax accountant will be able to assist you in preparing the tax return, planning, and representing you in front of the IRS. Y hablo español también. Sí, también hablo español. Okay, okay, es muy, muy importante. Okay. So when we talk about tax accounting, again, people many times understand that in order to file a tax return, you have to have a social security number, but I understand that's not accurate. Is that accurate? Co correct. You do need a taxpayer identification number when you're, you're filing your tax return. Uh, if you have a social security number, you're required to use your social security number. But a lot of individuals don't have social security numbers for whatever the reason is. They don't have a social security number. Uh, there is an alternative method you can apply for what's known as an Individual Taxpayer Identification Number, or in short, an ITIN. That number is used in lieu of the Social Security number when you're filing your tax return. So how do you, so you file that, um, you can go to a service, you can find it online too. You, you can do the W-7 form online, you can uh, do it with a tax accountant. There are uh, not-for-profits that will assist you in preparing the, the form. There's a lot of the different resources in, in, that will assist you in preparing the form. Do you have to pay anything? No. And how long well, does it take? As far as, uh, as if, if you go to a not-for-profit, then it's usually free. Uh, it depends on the tax uh, practitioner, the tax accountant. Most tax accountants will include it as part of the, the fee for preparing the tax return. But the IRS does not charge a fee, which is... No, they okay. don't. So, they, so it's a free form, and if you file your taxes with an... How long does it take if you file to get an ITIN number? Well, it could take several months. Uh, it, it all depends on, on the documentation you submit to the IRS. It, it does take several months to, for the IRS to review all your documentation. Mm -hmm. What kind of documentation? You are required to submit original documentation. It could be uh, something with, your, uh, with a photo, uh, some type of photo ID. It can be a passport, a, a, a state identification in the, in the country that you live in, a voter's registration card, birth certificate. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, these documentations would have to be submitted in original format, in original form to the IRS. They review it. If there is any additional questions, they will contact you and request an additional information, or they will just accept the, the documentation that, that you provided to them. So when we talk about if you submit voter's identification, it's not a voter's identification card from the United States. It would be from your home country. It would be from the home country, correct. Because right. if you're not a citizen, please don't vote. That's right. really, really key. So once you get an ITIN number, uh, again, you can use this, and uh, but there's some new regulations regarding ITIN numbers? Well, there is. Uh, there's a, a regulation that was passed, a legislation that was passed last year by Congress that re that's requiring certain individuals that have ITINs to renew those ITINs. Uh, these individuals that have ITINs, uh, and, and the situation is as follows. Uh, any, any taxpayer that received an ITIN before 2013, you're required to renew your ITIN. 
Uh, if you have a, a 9, 10 with the middle numbers either 7, 8 or 7, 9, you're required to renew your, your ITIN. If you receive a notice from the IRS, you're required to, to renew your ITIN. Um, so in short, if you haven't used an ITIN in the last three years, you're required to use an ITIN, or if you receive a notice from the IRS, you will be required to renew your ITIN. Okay, and, and renewing would be when you go to uh, a tax accountant, uh, they, would, they would do that for you. Correct, and it's the same process as before. When, initial, when you initially apply for an ITIN, it's a similar process. You will need to submit additional documentation. I'm just curious, why ITIN numbers with 7, 8, or 7, 9 in them, or do we know? Uh, it is my understanding the, the ITINs that were issued prior to 2013 had those middle digits 7, 8, and 7, 9. Okay. Uh, that's uh, the reason why it's 7, 8, 7, 9. So those are automatically will, will receive uh, a renewal notice uh, from the IRS. So if we're going to, people are, have to file by April 15th, is there enough time now to, for them to renew? Uh, to renew, yes, it usually takes about seven weeks to, if you already have an ITIN and you're just renewing, it takes about seven, seven to eight weeks to, to uh, renew your ITIN. So basically when you get your, what is it, W-W-4? Your W-2? Your W-2. W-2, 1099, correct. Then um, you go to make arrangements to pay taxes and that would be the time to renew. C correct. correct. Okay, so uh, do we have any idea why they decided to do this or... Uh, well, a lot of the, the uh, legislation that was passed last year was as, as, a, as a result or, or to respond to a lot of fraud that was going on throughout the years, a lot of uh, fraud with the tax credits, a lot of fraud uh, preparing fraudulent tax returns, uh, filing fraudulent tax returns. Uh, so they're trying to control the, the fraud and make sure that the individuals that you're claiming are actually an actual human being. So and you actually qualify to claim that person as a dependent. So I want to get into that, but I first meant, want to mention that uh, a lot of the tax preparers who are not licensed uh, encourage people to commit fraud. And even though they're supposed to be registered and they're supposed to sign the return, they don't. Mm -hmm. And the person who gets in trouble is the person who is the taxpayer. seeking the taxpayer. So uh, it's very important when you're going to be filing taxes to go to someone who has to comply with the law, who mm -hmm. will seek to try to protect you the best possible. Correct. So uh, let's talk about some of the fraudulent issues that are out there. I, I see uh, a lot dealing with dependents. Um, when people apply to become citizens, they have to show several years of tax Correct. returns. And when they apply for a loved one to get a resident visa, they also have to show tax returns. So uh, with a little help from Luis, um, I'm now trying to at least identify some things that could cause problems. Uh, dependence being a big one, uh, what is a dependent? Let's, let's start there. What, what is a well, dependent? Well, there's, there's two set of rules to, that, uh, that, that you need to meet uh, to, so you can claim somebody as a dependent. Uh, it depends on, on if it's either a qualifying child or a qualifying relative. So there's two different uh, dependent, uh, dependency tests, either qualifying child or qualifying relative. Under both tests, you either have to be a citizen, resident of the United States, uh, Canada, or Mexico. And then you would have to meet the test according to which ones apply. I'll go over the, the qualifying child test first, or the qualifying child uh, rules. For the qualifying child, in order to claim somebody under the qualifying child, not only do you have to meet the citizenship test that I just mentioned and residency test that I just mentioned, you also have to meet these four tests. Uh, the first one is relationship. That person has to be related to you by blood. Uh, so cousins do not count. So cousins do not count as, as, uh, as a relative. So you, a relative would be, of course, your siblings, your mother, I and mean, in this case it would be your siblings, a child of yours, uh, that would be the relationship test. What about nieces or nephews? That would count as well. Those are relationship. Cousins would not count. Uh, the other test that you would have to meet is under qualifying child would be the age test. Under the age test, the rule is under 19 or under 24 and a full-time student. Uh, so that's the age test. Uh, the third test is the self-support test. The old rule to claim somebody as a dependent was the taxpayer had to provide over 50% of the dependent support. Under the qualifying child test, the self-support test, it works backwards. As long as the dependent, the child, does not support himself or herself and all the other tests are met, you can claim that person as a dependent. 
And the last test is the home test. The person has to be, the, t the dependent would have to be living in your home. So for qualifying child tests is relationship, age, self-support, and home test. Now those are just the qualifying uh, child test. There's also qualifying relative, which is a set of uh, other rules that you, you must uh, meet to, to claim somebody as a dependent. So this is the way it works. If it doesn't meet the qualifying child test, then you see if qualifying relative uh, test works. Here are the rules for qualifying relative. The gross income test. That means your taxable income would have to be less than a specific amount. And that number is indexed each year. So for 2017, I mean 2016, your gross income would have to be less than 14, or the dependent's gross income would have to be less than 4,050. So that's the first test. The dependent's gross income would have to be less than 4,050. And then you have support. So here's the old rule coming in. The taxpayer provides more than 50% support of the dependent. Uh, so the first test is gross income, second test is support. The third test is relationship, same relationship rules as we went over in qualifying child, so it's the relationship test. But there's also a, a somewhat of a loophole regarding uh, the, 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 the last test. Either that person's related to you, or that person lived with you uh, throughout, your, throughout the year for the whole year uh, in your home. Uh, individuals can claim somebody that's not related to them, uh, if that person lived with you for the whole year. It has to be the exact whole year on the qualifying relative test. Uh, assuming they meet the gross income test, the support test, and a person that's not related to you would have to live there for the, for the whole year. I understand that NAFTA has a role in claiming dependents. Correct. Correct. So that's where, that's partially due to, the, the, the reason why I just cited the, the, you have to be a United States uh, or a resident or citizen of the United States, Canada, or Mexico, and that's actually part of the... the and you, but the you, could your relative live in Canada or Mexico? Yes, yes. So there's yes. sort of a loophole. Yes. Um, as, what, lo as long as you meet those tests, and if that person, if it's a child, then, uh, then uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's different. If it's a qualifying relative, again, the relationship test, the gross income test, the support test, and the relationship tests are met. Uh, but if it's somebody, let, let's say a cousin that you're trying to claim from Canada, you cannot claim that cousin because that, that cousin is not related to you. The only exception would be if that, can, if that cousin lived with you in the United States, uh, then you'll be able to, to claim. Or if you moved it to Canada and lived with your cousin for the whole year, then you'll, you'll be required. The dependent would have to live with you for the whole year. So you can live with someone in Canada and mm -hmm. still claim them as a dependent? Correct. Okay, Correct. well that's... So people have gotten into trouble because they can't prove the relationship. Correct. Uh, they can't prove that they provided 50% support. They provided the support. The dependency test, that is something that does get audited. Uh, dependents, along with related credits, that is something that does get audited a lot uh, from the, the IRS does, like, uh, you know, investigating those issues. Because there is a lot of fraud uh, regarding uh, dependencies and related, uh, related credits. Um, and another thing that they have issued regarding the legislation um, the Earned Income Credit, the Additional Child Tax Credit, and the American Opportunity Credit. Individuals that are, are expected to receive those type of credits, the, your refunds will be delayed. Uh, and it's not the IRS. The, it, it is the IRS, but it's through legislation that was passed by Congress uh, last year. Again, they're trying to respond to a lot of fraud going on with claiming dependents, claiming the, the related credits, and so on. So, uh, can someone claim an earned income credit and under what circumstances? For, well, that, the, to claim somebody for earned income credit, you, you, that dependent and, and the taxpayer would have a social security number for the earned income credit. Uh, for the child tax credit, it, it's different. It's not a requirement. And also for the, the American Opportunity Credit. But for the earned income credit, it has to be citizen or resident of the United States and you need a social security number for the dependent and for the taxpayer. When you uh, do your taxes, if you're receiving money through a contract with the state that they tell you is not taxable, do you have to include it in your taxes? Well, if, if, uh, if you're performing services, then it's taxable. Uh, I mean, that's the rule. It, it's, uh, everything is taxable unless there's a provision, provision that tells you otherwise. If you're performing services for, for cash or services for, for, for anything of value, you have to, you have to uh, re report it as, as income. Uh, chances are, in those situations, you will receive a 1099 from the, from the paying agency, in that case, the state agency. They will give you a 1099. Uh, that 1099, you will need to report it on your tax return, and it is subject to uh, FICA taxes, the self-employment taxes, in addition to the income tax.
because there's a lot of misinformation. I, I can't begin to tell you people who are doing work uh, tell me that, uh, oh, well, I don't have to report it because it's from the state. And I said, that that doesn't sound right. Correct. Correct. The, the rule is, uh, under Section 61 of the Internal Revenue Code, it states everything is considered gross income. There are some exclusions. Those exclusions, uh, any, anybody who wants to read it can be found, most of them at least, one, Sections 101 through 140 of the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, I've, see, I've heard it a lot too. Uh, you know, everybody's a tax expert during uh, this time. People tell you uh, if it's cash, you don't have to report it. Yes, you do have to report it. If you perform services, even if you perform services in exchange for services, bartering transaction, you have to report that as well. So again, uh, th there are a lot of people, and I find this that they, they go to someone who will tell them what they want to hear. Exactly. There, there, are, there are a lot of individuals that are doing tax returns. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of uh, uh, those individuals are not educated or don't know the tax law, and like you alluded to, they'll just tell the, the taxpayers what they want to hear, which can lead to the taxpayers committing or preparing a fraudulent tax return. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, the preparer is not on the hook for it, the, the taxpayer is. You're signing off on the tax return, so you're ultimately responsible for every item on the tax return. Uh, and a lot, what happens a lot, they say, well, I relied on the, this pr uh, tax preparers uh, to do the tax return, but the thing is a lot of th these uh, tax return preparers uh, do not follow the tax line, are not in compliance, are not licensed or, or registered uh, to prepare tax returns. And again, who would have thought that, you know, going in to become a United States citizen, you would have to produce copies of your taxes, and they will look them over, and... Uh, they do give you a chance to amend your taxes if you can't prove that you provided 50% support where it's required. Mm -hmm. But if you don't follow up on it, you will be denied based on good moral character, which means that you cannot reapply for five years. And if you wanted to bring your parents from another country, you won't be able to do that. So again, it's uh, very important that you follow the proper rules, that you obtain the advice that you need to get, because even if the IRS doesn't come after you, you don't want to lose the benefit for yourself or possibly a family member because you have taxes that were prepared improperly. Um, we have a couple minutes more. What advice would you give to people out there who know immigrants or are immigrants that uh, besides you may need to reapply for your ITIN number if you received it before 2013. Correct. If, well, first, if, if you are required to renew your ITIN, do it as soon as possible. Take it to your tax return preparer and make sure that, that they, they understand the renewal process. Uh, if you're expecting to claim a dependent in Canada or, or Mexico, make sure you get the, the ITIN, uh, the Form W-7 application started as soon as possible. As I mentioned earlier, that process uh, takes, uh, takes uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, you mentioned an issue regarding self-employed individuals. If you're self-employed and you're expected to get a 1099, um, you can include your business expenses as a deduction. So I would strongly encourage you, encourage you to start uh, adding up all your deductions you had, business deductions you had uh, last year. Uh, so it reduces that income amount to, to a lower amount and then you'll pay l less in taxes. Well, again, this is uh, really important information and sort of now is the time to start thinking about taxes and to, if you need to apply for your ITIN number, getting documents together to apply. I want to thank you so much for coming on and giving such information. Um, it's very helpful. Um, again, Luis uh, is a tax accountant teaching with me at Harold Washington College and, um, again, provides a lot of important information. We will be back uh, with a representative from a Chicago, uh, the Polish American Association, the 15th of February, 6.30, where hopefully we'll have an update for you on the Deferred Action Program for Childhood Arrivals. A little bit more information we'll have on what's going to happen. Um, if you have any questions, again, please do not panic. Please go to a workshop to know your rights. Come see us. The telephone number is 773-731-1762. Please, again, it's very important for you to get the facts and, and not uh, listen to a lot of the rhetoric out there. You have rights. You may not have the right to be here permanently, but you have the right to see a judge. You do have rights. And please, again, um, 
have some faith. So I want to thank you very much for watching this evening. And we look forward, and thank you again, Thanks Louise. For having me. Look forward to seeing you in February. Thank you.